There's not a friend like the lonely Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. No else can heal all our souls' diseases. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lonely Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. There's not an hour that he is not near us. No, not one. No, not one. No night so dark, but his love can cheer us. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lonely Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Our speaker this hour, whom is a person that is a delight to be around. If you don't know Jacob Martin, you need to get to know Jacob Martin. Jacob is a first year student, and no, second year student, sorry. I'm trying to keep you longer, Jacob, that's all. And he's a second year student, and his topic this hour is in 1 Peter. He is the theme of the Old Testament prophecy. In 2 Peter, he is a long suffering saver. Jacob, come speak to us. Good morning. It is an honor to speak. This, here this morning at this lectureship, it's been an incredible theme. Thank you, Jeff, for coming up with this topic, Jesus Christ, the center of the Bible. It's been encouraging hearing everybody preach their topics, going for all these New Testament books. And I have a kind of a challenge to preach First and Second Peter and the time that we got, but we'll try to make this work. So in this hour, I've been assigned both First and Second Peter and have two topics to present in the remaining hour. First Peter, Christ, the center of Old Testament prophecy, and Second Peter, Christ, the long-suffering Savior. Diving into both of these epistles have been greatly beneficial. As the more I've gone and studied both of these books the more in common they are with one another, especially in consideration with the two topics that we'll be studying this hour. But before we examine the meat of this text, there first needs to be context on who was the human author of these books. When they were written, who was the original audience at the time they were written, and what was the purpose for these two books of the Bible. Both First and Second Peter were likely written around the same time frame, around A.D. 67-68. The Apostle Peter was the human writer of both of these epistles, and they were both written near the end of his life, as evidenced in 2 Peter 1, 12-15, where Peter writes, For this reason, uh, it's on the wrong chapter, uh, but it is Second Peter 1, 12 or 15. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right as long as I am in this tent. The King James says tabernacle, but in both instances it refers to the physical body. 
to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. Peter knew that he was about to die soon and was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write these epistles so that the first century Christians who were receiving these letters would be reminded of the things which Peter encouraged them to practice as fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Both first and second Peter were written to a general assortment of Christians, predominantly Gentile Christians who were scattered throughout the known world. 1 Peter 1.1 1, 1 mentions them as pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. These were Christians who were spread out due to the ongoing persecution during the Roman Empire. 1 Peter 1.2 describes them as the elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Wait a minute, it says elect. We were talking on the Arise the Truth radio program yesterday. Elect is often abused. There's the Calvinistic view where God predetermined and cherry-picked who all was going uh, uh, who I was going to be saved without giving mankind the choice to do so. That's not what Peter is saying here. No, the elect that's in the Bible are elect in the sense that those who chose to obey the will of God, the Father, and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who are approved by God and listed in his book of life. Because the persecution was so strong, especially during the reign of Emperor Nero, who was in charge during this time, and he notoriously persecuted Christians. That's documented all throughout human history. Peter reminded them that though they are strangers and pilgrims living in a strange world of wickedness and sin, they can remain comforted through the living hope that is in Christ Jesus. And we read this in 1 Peter 1, 3-5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. By the time A.D. 67-68 rolled around, a new generation of Christians have come who did not get to experience the ministry of Christ, nor did they witness his death, burial, and resurrection, nor were part of the 3,000 souls who obeyed the gospel when the New Testament church was initially established in A.D. 33, recorded in Acts chapter 2. But Peter was an eyewitness. He was one of the 12 disciples called by Christ to make fishers of men, Matthew 4:19, also in Luke chapter 5. He witnessed Christ's transfiguration on the mountain, recorded in both Matthew 17 and Mark 9. He, James, and John formed a special bond with Jesus that's commonly referred to as the inner circle. He was zealous for Christ and sought to protect Jesus even when he was being betrayed and arrested, cutting off the ear of the servant Malchus in John 18.10. He was also imperfect and denied Christ three times, yet he also repented and confessed his love for the Lord also three times following his resurrection in John chapter 21. Peter is a man who has seen it all throughout his life, from the time spent with Jesus to his own personal and spiritual growth along with being given the keys to the kingdom by Christ and presenting the first gospel sermon on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, establishing the Lord's church. By the time we get to Peter and these two epistles, 1 Peter 5.1 tells us, The elders who are among you I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. Peter is an elder of the Lord's church. 
Uh, a lot of Catholics believe that Peter was the first pope, but as Wesley Simons pointed out in his lesson the other day, there was no pope in the first century, so Peter was not the pope. He was an elder of the church. And not only that, but as he's writing these letters to predominantly Gentile Christians, we see that he's also finally accepted Gentiles into the Lord's church after struggling with prejudice between his initial hesitancy of converting Cornelius and his household in Acts chapter 10 when he received the vision uh, with the meat and also conforming to the pattern of prejudiced Jews in Galatians chapter 2 where Paul had to withstand Peter to his face. Now that Peter is older, he's wiser and more humble, and now he's an elder of the church and is on the verge of physical death, with a new generation of Christians arising, he is encouraged to know that the Christians that he is writing to, though they never saw all the things Jesus did, their faith still stands. Thus uh, being taught by those who saw the Lord Jesus Christ and were converted at Pentecost, thus confirming in Romans ten seventeen that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Peter compliments their faith, boldness, and joyfulness as he continues to write in 1 Peter 1, 6 through 9. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Though you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. As we move into our first point of discussion this morning, that Christ being the center of Old Testament prophecy, it is worth noting that Jesus had always been there, since the beginning of time. He was the word that was with God and is God, John 1.1. 1, 1. He was in the beginning with God in John 1.2 and had been prophesied in scripture as early as Genesis 3.15 when God revealed what's called the seed promise. God said to Satan in the Garden of Eden, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Satan bruised the head of Christ by ensuring his sufferings on the cross, but Christ forever bruised the devil's head by being raised from the dead and giving Christians hope of eternal redemption. Throughout the centuries, Christ had been prophesied to give the Jews hope for the Savior to come. And now that he has already come into the world, to fulfill what God had originally promised way back in Genesis 3.15, as Christians, we can now read the complete picture of God's character, his plan for mankind, and his purpose for what we are to live through him. In Peter's first epistle, he had this to say about the accuracy of the scriptures and how it pertains to the salvation of Jesus Christ. Let's read 1 Peter 1. 10 through 12. Peter says, Of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. I'd love to speak more on that last point, things which angels desire to look into, but I'm on a time crunch. I can't dive into that. We've got other things to talk about. Uh, but we've already established that this epistle was written to a generation after Christ's ascension into heaven. 
That's something that was preached marvelously the other day when we looked at the book of Acts, uh, Tony Haas. Uh, and these Christians were not there when he did all these wonderful things. Uh, though they were strong in their faith, they still needed continued encouragement in the midst of persecution. And that's what Peter is emphasizing here with these verses, reminding them that Jesus had been in the picture since the beginning of time. Though the prophets received this information under the Old Testament and would not reap the benefits of Christ's salvation, through the Spirit of God, these prophets were blessed to proclaim this information for the future generations, Peter's generation and even up to this present time under the new covenant that we're under. For they knew that God would keep his promises and fulfill the things that were set up and these various prophecies. For example, Isaiah 53 is a well-known prophecy about the suffering Savior. In verses 5 and 6, it's written, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Because of the explicit details of Christ's suffering in this passage, you'd think that Isaiah was a key witness, an eyewitness of the pain that Jesus endured on the cross. Yet it was actually a prophetic account written 700 years prior to the event which ultimately took place. This demonstrates that everything recorded in the Bible is reliable. All the facts in every single book are in harmony. And the scripture cannot be broken. John 10.35 Peter encourages his first century brethren to continue as we read in 1 Peter 1.13 Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. What does that mean? Other translations word it as prepare your mind for action. He continues, be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Why, Peter? Why are you telling this to us? Let's go to 120. He, Christ, indeed, was foreordained or chosen before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, 21, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Peter also reiterates the reliability of the scriptures when he addressed this topic again over in his second epistle. These two epistles go hand in hand together. Remember when reading this text that Peter was one of the twelve apostles and a key eyewitness that Christ came to fulfill the law and the prophets, Matthew 5, 17. Let's read 2 Peter 1, 16 through 21. It says, For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, we referring to the apostles, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty, for he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we, this is referring to Peter, James, and John, heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain, the mountain of transfiguration, Matthew 19. Peter continues, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And First Peter we read that the prophets were foretellers, men who spoke of days to come according to God's divine plan, which were fulfilled once Christ came on the scene in the first century. 
when the Son of God fulfilled God's plan, as we just read a moment ago in 2 Peter 1, 16-21, it was the responsibility of Peter, James, John, eventually Paul, when we get to Acts, along with the rest of the apostles, inspired by the Holy Spirit during the time of miracles, to confirm that Christ was who he says he was, while the completed word of God was being written. The Bible is not an elaborate hoax to manipulate the people into accepting compared to the man-made religions and creed books that you see in the 21st century today. No, this book is 100% reliable and was conceived by an eternal being who truly cared about the care and well-being of his creation. If you think about it, if the Bible was created entirely by man, this book will be full of errors, contradictions, biases, prejudices, because our human nature is flawed and imperfect. God, on the other hand, is perfect. And we need to consider it a blessing that our Heavenly Father used His Holy Spirit to guide these men throughout the centuries to write all the words in the completed Bible that we read and study today. I even did a Google search to check how many words are in the Bible. It varies depending on translations. Uh, some have more, some have less. I'll uh, compare the two translations that are commonly read in this church, uh, this congregation. In the New King James, there are 770,430 words. The King James has 783,000 words. 137 words. That's a lot of words to study. Uh, quoting from Isaiah 40, 6 through 8, Peter concludes this thought by telling his readers this in 1 Peter 1, 22 through 25. He says, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit and sincere love of the brethren, Love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever, because, and this is where he quotes from Isaiah 40, all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever and then peter continues to write now this is the word by which the gospel was preached to you and then as we begin chapter two therefore laying aside all malice all deceit hypocrisy envy and all evil speaking as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby if indeed you have tasted that the lord is gracious the cares of this physical world are only temporary, while the word of the Lord endures forever, which is why it's important to crave and desire the pure milk, the spiritual food of God's word. Another thing to consider when talking about Christ being the center of Old Testament prophecy is that without Christ being that center, the rock of our salvation, we would not have the church that we are worshiping under today. Of course, when I say church, I do not mean this nice building, but the church, the Greek word ekklesia, which is defined the called out, the holy people of God who are sanctified or called out from the ways of the world and living a life acceptable in his sight. Too many people forget that this building is not the holy sanctuary of God. We, the people, are his church. As Peter would word it in 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, that's referring to the Christians who live in the world but are not of the world's ways, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles. In this case, the reference to Gentiles means those living in the world that are of the world's ways. 
Peter continues that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. With that established as part of this special body, the church, it is important to remember that without Christ as the head of the church, then our worship is in vain, and it will be no worse than that of worshiping a false idol. This is something many in the religious world fail to grasp, as many reject the words of Christ and rely more on their own creed books and their own folly and their ignorant quest for worship and religion. So why is this a must to have Christ as our center? Because even under the Old Testament, it was prophesied that Christ, the Messiah, would be the head of his church. Let's read 1 Peter 2, 4 through 6. 1 Peter 2, 4 through 6. Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also as living stones are being built up, a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, and here Peter references Isaiah 28, 16. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Christ is the head of all things, including his church, which would not be possible without his death, burial, and resurrection, things which have been prophesied since the Old Testament, as we previously looked earlier this morning at Isaiah 53. However, there is a catch. As to be part of the body of Christ, we need to believe in all his words and teachings, not the Pope's, not Joseph Smith's, not Pastor Bob, not even Jacob Martin's words. Yes, I'm the speaker this hour, but all I'm preaching is going by what the Bible says. Not that I want to add or take away. That's condemned in the scriptures according to Revelation 22, 18 through 20. Peter would then warn his readers the consequences of not abiding by the teachings of Christ as he continues in verses 7 and 8 of chapter 2. Therefore, to you who believe he is precious... But to those who are disobedient, here he quotes from Psalm 118.22, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And then he quotes Isaiah 8.14, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Peter continues, they stumble being disobedient to the word to which they were also appointed. Regardless of where one stands on Christ, Christ will still remain the commander-in-chief, the head honcho of the church, despite initially being rejected by the Jews who should have known that he was the Messiah. Man may try to do things his own way, but man cannot overpower the authority of Jesus Christ, no matter how hard they try. If they do not accept the words of Christ and submit to his will, then they are doomed for destruction if they fail to repent of their actions, being offended by the word of God in favor of their own agenda. That's why it's so important to belong to the one and only church which Jesus built through the shedding of his own blood, Acts 20:28. 20, the church which the apostle Peter described as we continue our reading as we wrap up this first point in 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. He says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Let me back that up. A royal priesthood. Contrary to popular belief, what the world sees as priest, when we become children of God, we become God's priests and our service to him, Christ the high priest of his church. Peter continues, You are a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 
who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And this word mercy, which is derived from the Greek word elephantes, hope I said that right, I'm not a Greek scholar, that means to have pity on, that's a great segue into our second topic this hour, that Christ is the long-suffering Savior based on 2 Peter. For our study so far, it's been established that Peter's two epistles were written close to one another to dispersed Gentile Christians who were suffering due to widespread persecution. And not only that, but Peter's audience, like much we deal with in the church today, 2024, they had to deal with false teachers who were deceiving the people with their false view of religion. As Peter writes, as we read 2 Peter 2, 1 through 3, but there were also false prophets among the people. Uh, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. The King James even goes above and says, damnable heresies. This is serious stuff, folks. Even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time, their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction will not slumber. And then, as we go to the last part of verse 10 in this chapter, these teachers are prescribed as presumptuous, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries, and other translations word this as angelic majesties or celestial beings. And then their evil is continually talked about throughout this chapter as we go to verse 12. But these, like natural brute beasts made to be caught and destroyed, speak evil of the things they do not understand and will utterly perish in their own corruption and will receive the wages of unrighteousness as those who count at pleasure to carouse in the daytime. They are spots and blemishes, carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. They have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. These false teachers in Peter's day run parallel to the false teachers that we see today. The, the false teachers in Peter's day, the false teachers today, regardless of the generations, these teachers hold wrong views on fundamental issues, moral issues, and spiritual issues. And sadly, they have done their part in deceiving many souls over the centuries. And as we move deeper into this point of Christ, our long-suffering Savior, as we move into 2 Peter chapter 3, we must remember the reasoning why the Holy Spirit drove Peter to write these things to the first century Christians. Why are you, why are you writing this, Peter? Because of the rampant confusion spread by the false teachers and even among the scoffers. Beginning in verse 1 of chapter 3, Peter writes, Beloved, now I write to you this second epistle, and both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days. What do you mean by last days? That's referring to the time span between Christ's ascension into heaven all the way up to the present day. Peter continues, they are walking according to their own lust. These scoffers are saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Much like today, you have people who rely too much on the cares of this world that they think the world will keep on turning and spinning, not believing that Jesus will return to call the faithful home 
because that round sphere has kept rotating for the past 2,000 years since the New Testament was initially written. Has Jesus forgotten his promise that he would return again as recorded in the latter half of Matthew 24 and again in 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, chapter 4? Absolutely not. As Peter would continue to write in 2 Peter 3, 8 and 9, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. That means that time in heaven is eternal, and God does not think of time as we do here on earth. Peter continues, verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Greek word for long-suffering is the word, if, I, if anything that I've learned when I had Jeff Johnson for Greek class, it was always this word, macrophemia. What does that mean? The word is literally translated long and coming to anger. Or slow to anger. If you have a pen, underline verse 9 if you have to. Because this is a powerful, compelling verse to consider this morning. You have a powerful, just, fair God who could have returned at any minute. But because of his slow wrath, his longness in coming to anger, and his mercy toward his creation, as Chuck pointed out, and his lesson yesterday on the merciful judge, 2 Thessalonians, and his willingness for all men to come to repentance. That's why Jesus hasn't returned yet, because he knows there are still people out there seeking truth and turning to him. Yes, it's easy, because the world is so wicked in sin, to wonder when Jesus will eventually return, but we should thank God for his continued patience, so that as many who are willing to obey the gospel, to be baptized into his name, and to be added to the Lamb's book of life, can obtain eternal salvation while this physical earth still stands. Because there will come a day, whether that be tonight, tomorrow, days, months, years into the future, when it's too late to repent, when Jesus does return. However, just because Christ is that long-suffering, patient Savior who's slow, long in coming to anger, macrophemia, that does not mean we can put off the responsibilities we're instructed to fulfill as Christians and do whatever we want because we're saved under God's grace. That's something, again, Wesley pointed out yesterday in the Romans class in Romans 6. Peter had already instructed his readers to gird up the loins of your mind or prepare your minds for action in 1 Peter 1.13. So why would he say anything else otherwise because the Lord is long-suffering and patient towards us? The truth of the matter is yet, yes, Christ is patient and he's still giving people a chance to repent and turn back to him. We still do not know when he is coming back. Peter talks about this great and awesome day of the Lord. Uh, Paul mentioned it to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 4. Peter will talk about it to his readers in 2 Peter 3, 10 through 12. And the day of the Lord in this context is referring to Christ's eventual second coming. Uh, there's many definitions in the Bible on the day of the Lord. But it's the second coming in this context. But in 2 Peter 3, 10 through 12... Peter writes, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. At some point, whether we live to see it or not, depending on when Jesus decides to return, everything in this physical world 
will be destroyed. But as Peter pointed out, as the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, it will also happen when we least expect it. We got to be living right, folks. When Christ returns and we're still living during that day of the Lord, what do you suppose will happen if he returns and catches any of us in the middle of a sinful act without the time or the chance to repent of such actions? I don't know about you, but that would not be a good look. Sadly, there are Christians out there who started out as strong, faithful, obedient Christians dedicated to serving the Lord, but through different circumstances, whether being choked by the ways of the world or being deceived by the false teachers, as we've previously discussed throughout 2 Peter 2, they'll fall away from the truth and return back to their old sinful lives before their baptism into Christ. How sad of a day that will be for the erring brother or sister who falls away from the faith and never repents, and more tragically, where they'll end up going spiritually. Let's read 2 Peter 2, 20 through 22. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them to have not known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. Uh, these two proverbs in verse 22, uh, the first of the two is actually... Uh, taken back from an earlier passage in Scripture. Uh, the original context, which has a sharper sting, is found in Proverbs 26, 11, where it says, As a dog returns to his own vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. The consequences of hell have been horribly downplayed by many in the religious world today. But as Denver pointed out in his lesson yesterday as preachers we need to preach the whole counsel of God it still needs to be preached as hell cannot be overlooked just because none of us wants to go to the place of torment prepared for the devil and his angels but Peter states it plainly here for the erring brother or sister who does not repent before death the latter end is worse for them than the beginning and it would have been better for them to have not known the way of righteousness. These two statements imply that there are worse degrees of punishment mentally for those who will be suffering in hell. Why do I say mentally? Because sin is still sin, torment is still torment, and suffering is still suffering in regards to the unfaithful who never put God in their lives. But for the once faithful Christian who fell hard, can you imagine seeing them in total darkness, being separated from God for all eternity, tormented by eternal fire, and reflecting upon the lives they lived, suffering and remorse? I can imagine them saying, man, I had it good as a child of God. How foolish of me to throw it all away and pay the price for it. That's why as Christians, regardless of what goes on around us, the trials, the tribulations, the sufferings, the persecutions, whatever happens in this physical world, it's important to remember to live a life worthy of holy conduct and godliness while this present earth still stands. So that when our long-suffering Savior returns to call the faithful home, whether those living and the day he does return, or those who have since perished, we can look forward to living an eternal life with our Heavenly Father and Christ our Savior. Peter concludes his final epistle by encouraging his readers, the original generation that had these letters in AD 67, 68, and to the Christian in 2024 who reads and applies word today. 
the final words of the Apostle Peter in 2 Peter 3, 14 through 18. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found in him in peace, without spot, and blameless. And consider that the long-suffering, the macrophemia of our Lord Jesus is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, and which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. Yes, there's false teachers out there who do everything in their power to distort the truth and deceive innocent souls from what's really in the scriptures. But much like in Peter's time, when there was a whole generation of Christians who fought the good fight, even when they never saw or heard Jesus Christ when he was on earth, the Christian today can also grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's why we have these lectureships every year. And why there's schools of preaching and Christian development like Tri-Cities. And why we're encouraged to study our Bibles throughout the week, every day. And why events like polishing the pulpit exist. We need to continually renew our minds through the study of God's word. Or else we'll be easily deceived by false teachers and be conformed to the deadly standards of this physical world that will one day be destroyed in fervent heat on that great and awesome day of the Lord. Because even when we suffer as a Christian, when we defend the word of God, which is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, Hebrews 4.12, share it with others who will listen and walk in the light, we will be in good standings with God, as Peter tells us in 1 Peter 3, 13 through 17. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled, referencing Isaiah 8, 12. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense or an answer, in the King James, to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. In conclusion... In our study on both 1st and 2nd Peter, we can see the full picture of Christ's plan to save man through his Son and our Savior Jesus Christ. One that had been foretold since the beginning of creation. That's been verified throughout the scriptures by the Old Testament prophets, confirmed by his eyewitness disciples who wrote down the things they saw and his words, and even today, his long slowness of anger because he wants as many souls who will hear and receive his words to come to the full knowledge of the truth so they too can be saved. Peter's epistles were designed to strengthen the Christian and give them hope and assurance through the trials of life so they can inherit everlasting life. We're told in 2 Peter 1, 5 through 9, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to ver perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. And then Peter writes in verse 10, and 11. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We were called when we made the decision 
to hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized into Christ for the remission of our sins. 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us that in Christ we are a new creation. Being in Christ, we must live the life of a Christian by submitting to God's will as recorded all throughout the completed Bible that we read and study today. And this Christ-like attitude as that of a servant needs to be a 24-7, 100% commitment each and every day. Peter reminds the Christian past and present as we wrap up this hour. 1 Peter 5, 8 through 11. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let us strive to walk in the light and encourage our fellow brethren to do the same, along with convincing the lost to be found and be added to the body of Christ, while Christ, the center of Old Testament prophecy, and our long-suffering Savior allows it. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jacob. In just a moment, we're going to be dismissed for lunch. Uh, lunch is provided by the Cherokee Church of Christ and the Fellowship Hall in the, in the school building. Before we do that, um, Brother Milton Matters is going to close some prayer and offer thanks for the food in just a moment. But before we does that, I want to take the time to thank a few people myself. Um, I don't know if we've ever had, I know last year on the last day we had around 50 in attendance. This last hour, counting who's over here and over there, it was 63. And so that's, that's really good. We appreciate very much your attendance and your, uh, participation uh, this year in the lectureship. Uh, I want to thank Ethan Tate. If you, don't, uh, if you don't know Ethan, he's the forehead sticking over the, the <laughs> he just does, <laughs> he's over there. Um, the second year classroom was the work of Ethan Tate. Ethan did most, of, well, all of that. Uh, he's worked tireless nights, and I think even some nights he even stayed here at the school building getting things ready, um, the media, the sound, the cameras, um, getting things set up for the Rise True program, that classroom. Uh, he's done a tremendous job uh, behind the scenes as well. Also, let me thank Vicki Manuel. Kim Taylor, Kathy Jones, Rachel Smith, Kaylee Haas, Haas, sorry, Haas, uh, Rhonda Haywood, Kay Simons, Hannah Leonard, and there may be more that helped get the decorations for the Friends and Alumni Dinner. There are a lot of things that when you plan a lectureship, there are a lot of things that has to be in play and in place and it gets kind of stressful sometimes because you don't know who's not going to be able to make it because they're sick. You don't know if, like, plans for the pizza, you know, Monday. I mean, there's always something that's going to, to throw a, a, a pothole or something's, something's going to happen. But there's people like this that will help out and you make it through. Let me thank also those who prepared food, Shady Valley, Church of Christ, Rome Mountain, Church of Christ, Stony Creek Church of Christ, and today the Cherokee Church of Christ. You don't know what a load that is in helping us with a lectureship uh, to that food uh, to prepare for lunch each day. That is a tremendous help. It really is. Thank you so much for that. Now, I want to say this. There are, there are a group uh, of people that I think sometimes get overlooked at the lectureship for what they do. And that is our student body. And I'm not going to call them by their student, the student body. I'm going to call you by your name. Drew Cranawetter, Justin Haas, Robert Taylor, Nathan Tate, Denver Tate, Dennis Smith, Jacob Martin. I hope I didn't miss one. Thank you so much for what you have done this week, 
and the weeks to come, the weeks prior to this week, there, are, there is a lot, a ton of preparation. These guys have stayed after school, cleaning floors in the fellowship hall, moving tables, setting up tables, having to move tables again, setting up tables again, uh, helping Ethan over here. These guys have done a whole lot of work. Now, guys, it may be unnoticed by some, but it is not unnoticed by all. Thank you so much for what you have done this week in helping out with the cleaning of the building, the bathrooms. Uh, you might, you've probably seen guys get up and go out. That's because they're going to help in another area that they've been assigned to. So if you see these students, thank them for what they've done. I know throughout the week it's, people have said, you know, hey, thank Jeff he put this together. But if it hadn't been for those students and the people behind the scenes, this probably would have been a disaster. So thank them. They are the ones that need to be commended for the hard work. And uh, is there anything else, Bill, you need to announce before we dismiss? If you don't mind, uh, let us stand. Milton's going to come forward and word us in prayer off of thanks for the food. And then we'll be back in here at 1 o'clock. Let us pray together. Father in heaven, we humbly come to you before your presence this wonderful, beautiful day that you allow us to enjoy. We're so very thankful, Father, to you and your Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, and your powerful word of truth that we have the privilege to uh, assemble before you and hearing these lessons being preached by faithful gospel preachers. We're thankful for the oversight of the elders here to have such a lectureship like this and have a school of preaching like this to train men to go out and preach and to have this exercise of speaking before an audience. We're so very thankful that you made this all possible. And we're thankful, Father, for each one that attended and all the great lessons that we've heard. Thank you for all the ladies and all those who prepared food and, and all the others as Jeff to make this program a, a good program. More, more programs like this will be established. We look forward to the classes this afternoon as well. And we pray that you bless the food that we're about to take, may strengthen our bodies. Thank you for the Cherokee Church to supply this food for us. We're so very thankful for them and their support in this effort. Forgive us our sins, keep us in our care, we pray in Jesus. We humbly 